My name is James Steele. I'm an exercise physiologist uh, and biomechanist. I came to know the 21 convention through Anthony Johnson's blog. Um, commenting, reading on his posts, uh, got introduced to the 21 convention um, and Anthony felt that I could add a lot to it through my specific expertise and some of my philosophical orientations as well and some of my knowledge in that area. First year I presented at the 21 convention I covered two topics, um, my specialist area of research, chronic lower back pain and uh, an exercise perspective on that um, and also objectivist philosophy. The talk I did on chronic lower back pain um, covered some of my thoughts on its main causes um, and how to tackle them from an exercise uh, perspective, how to either prevent and or treat uh, people with chronic lower back pain. Um, my talk on objectivist philosophy, uh, that was put together as an introduction to objectivist philosophy, covering the, the four main branches, uh, metaphysics, epistemology, ethics um, and politics as well. My review of the literature has led to me to um, form the idea that specifically weakness of the lumbar extensor musculature as opposed to the trunk extensor musculature uh, is responsible for uh, development of lower back pain, the persistence of lower back pain and many of the symptoms that are normally associated with that condition. Um, it seems to me as well, looking back over some of the uh, anthropological and uh, paleoanthropological research that humans as a um, species may be pre predisposed anatomically to developing weak lumbar extensor musculature. The main approach that I recommend for people with chronic lower back pain is from an exercise perspective, being that my thoughts on the predominant cause or the, the ultimate cause of most uh, lower back pain is weakness of the lumbar extensors. Um, a specific exercise approach uh, seems to be the most rational way of treating that. Um, it deals with the specific cause as opposed to dealing with the myriad symptoms that are associated with it and uh, at the moment the the main uh, exercise approach that seems to be most effective in dealing with that specific cause is uh, the use of a specific isolated lumbar extension, i.e. the Medex lumbar extension machine, um, although there are other uh, machines available on the market which try to offer similar uh, approaches. Gustav Zander started off with some initial uh, resistance machines um, which allow trunk extension to be performed um, and DeLorme and Watkins use similar um, custom-built equipment um, but with the aim of trying to limit movement of the pelvis by using some sort of restraint uh, mechanism. Um, since then other machines have been developed, Nautilus, Cybex and a whole host of other ones which provide uh, lower back equipment uh, as they call it but the restraint systems they use, uh, some are better and some are worse, culminating in the op most optimal restraint system being that used by the Medex Lumbar Extension. Um, the earlier equipment can provide some stimulus to the lumbar extensors to improve and adapt uh, in terms of strength and endurance, fatigability, etc. But none of them, in terms of the research I've reviewed and the research that I and my colleagues have conducted, um, show that the Medex is most optimal for producing adaptations in the lumbar extensors in both those without chronic lower back pain um, and also producing the most optimal clinical outcomes i.e. reductions in pain um, and perceived disability in those with lower back pain. So the Medex appears to be currently the most optimal form. There are other equipment which is being designed um, but it seems to me that the uh, most important thing is the restraint system that's being used. Renex equipment or Renaissance exercise equipment, um, they, one of the first pieces of equipment or the first piece of equipment that they unveiled was their trunk extension machine. Um, from what I've seen of the trunk extension machine in terms of uh, its design and its, uh, the writings around it, it appears to be a, uh, a very good 
trunk extension machine, which is exactly what it's labeled as. Some of the problems I have with some of the claims made around it are um, with regards to the restraint system used on it. It's very clear to me from the research uh, that I've examined and the research that's been conducted uh, by myself and my, uh, my colleagues that the restraint system utilized by the MedEx is, is necessary to appropriately isolate and load the lumbar extensors. So I disagree with some of the claims uh, made by Renex with regards to um, their thoughts on not needing that restraint system. It seems clear to me that the restraint system is necessary, certainly for the most optimal gains. But uh, it does seem uh, sensible that the trunk extension that Renex have produced and any other trunk extension equipment can produce some degree of adaptation in the, in the lumbar extensors, though it may not be optimal. Is there a line that needs to be drawn um, with regards to which machines should or should not be used? Um, I, I don't necessarily think it's that simple. It depends upon the objectives for using that machine. So if you're working with someone who has chronic lower back pain, um, then it, to me it seems that the most optimal way of achieving beneficial goals in that population with regards to reducing pain and disability um, and improving lumbar extension strength. Uh, the MedEx is at one end of the spectrum. All the other machines tend to fall further behind that and that's predominantly because they offer trunk extension as opposed to isolated lumbar extension. So they're not specific in what they seek to uh, produce. Now that makes it very difficult to then differentiate between which ones are best and which ones are not because when you're performing trunk extension as a compound movement differences in anatomy between different participants using that piece of equipment are going to vary the amount of loading that the lumbar extensors actually experience during that and therefore the degree to which they fatigue, the degree to which uh, motor units are activated and therefore the degree to which they're going to achieve any uh, adaptations from those exercises. So. I don't think there's no benefit from using inferior pieces of equipment with regards to restraints. Um, I think some benefit can be derived from them, but that's going to depend upon uh, the individual. And if the MedEx lumbar extension, whether the medical or the exercise uh, version, is available, then that would be my preferred choice of equipment to use with uh, those participants. For those who don't have necessarily access, maybe at the moment or at any time, to specialist equipment like the uh, MedEx Lumbar Extension, I think that there uh, are various solutions to that. Um, with those who are never going to be able to have access to it, for example, people who are traveling uh, or, or certainly not regular access to it, then using those other exercises, those trunk extension movements, will provide some benefit. It's difficult to objectively quantify what that benefit will be, especially with regards to its effects on the lumbar extensors specifically. But they will derive some benefit from doing it. So whether that's performing deadlifts or whether that's using a generic uh, lower back machine that can be found in any gym that they can head into, then um, they're going to get something from it. Whether that's home-based trunk extension exercises using a Roman chair, uh, a Roman chair device, they're still going to get some benefit from it. Is it going to be optimal? No. The MedEx will provide greater improvements. The ideal. The ideal. But personally, I think that um, because of the uh, pr improvements that the MedEx produces, there should be more awareness about the equipment and gyms should be looking at and uh, physiotherapy clinics should be looking at investing in that equipment. Um, there's also been research done on industrial applications of it, i.e. private companies purchasing the equipment and using it as on-site occupational uh, therapy for their employees who have been injured. Uh, it makes economic sense for them to rehabilitate their own employees instead of going for insurance programs etc etc to try and get external companies or whatever, uh, it depends on what the uh, insurance system or the medical system in that country, how that works. But they will get some benefit from using other devices or other exercises, but I think the, the best solution is to increase awareness and get more people um, interested in using the more optimal devices, the ideal equipment that's going to produce the best improvements for them. A few years back, Doug McGuff uh, produced a video looking at a couple of different um, 
variations on lower back exercises that people can do who haven't got access to specialist equipment. One of those being a, a trunk extension performed using a um, specifically a super slow systems pull down uh, machine in his gym. Um, my thoughts on, on this uh, run along the same lines as my thoughts on other trunk extension exercises. There's likely to be some benefit and some uh, degree of loading and fatigue produced in the lumbar extensors. Whether or not that's optimal though is, um, is yet to be seen. Uh, I think it will provide some benefit uh, in terms of strengthening the lumbar extensors and therefore potentially reducing pain and disability in those who have got chronic lower back pain. Um, but again, it's something that can be used if access to more specialised equipment, i.e. the Medex lumbar extension, isn't available. So it's a valuable tool, as the other exercises can be, in the absence of the more ideal tool. I first came across um, Anthony and the 21 convention actually through Doug McGuff and John Little's uh, site for the Body by Science book. I was, I'd recently purchased the book um, and I was following through the uh, blog that they had, reading their weekly posts, uh, reading through the commenters discussions and contributing to that as well myself. Um, and Anthony was a regular contributor there as well and I think it was around the same time that he had started to get into uh, the Body by Science approach to training. Um, so I followed through from his comments on there, found his personal blog, started reading a lot of his posts. Um, at the same time uh, I was also getting into uh, philosophy more deeply, it had always been something I'd been interested in um, and specifically reading a lot of Ayn Rand's works. Uh, I'd recently read Atlas Shrugged and was working my way through her non-fiction books. Uh, Anthony's post resonated with my thoughts at the time uh, and I started contributing to various different personal posts he had on his blog uh, regarding philosophy, exercise, and nutrition um, and other topics uh, and, and from his blog I then obviously found out about the 21 convention itself and that it was a, a convention depicting this idea of the ideal man in, in all aspects of his life about individualism um, and succeeding in the various things which contribute to a, a meaningful and happy life for, uh, for an individual. So initially I was drawn to the 21 convention through that exercise link through Body by Science and the first videos I started watching were at the time Drew Bay's videos on there. I was familiar with Drew Bay's work as well uh, and it was the exercise link that really first got me in there. Um, at the time I wasn't interested in any of the pickup stuff uh, and I didn't look through it. Uh, it wasn't until I actually came and spoke at the convention that I actually started listening to the uh, other speakers in topics which I at the time didn't think I'd be interested in. Um, but it was then that I started to learn that, that all of these different topics that were being discussed at the convention, um, as it was evolving and as it was expanding in the different topics it, uh, it portrayed, uh, were really complementary to each other and there were a lot of uh, principles that were being discussed in each of the different selected topics that kind of translated from one to the other. There was a real congruence about the convention in terms of the different topics being spoken. It was a very holistic approach, it was a very congruent approach and I think that really kind of resounded with me because I like to take the principles that I uh, have learnt through philosophy and logic and science and apply them to every aspect um, of my life and that's what the convention seemed to convey, um, finding that success as a whole uh, but applying the same principles in each different aspect of your life to create that kind of whole. And I've heard it a lot, I've read it online that um, a lot of people dismiss the 21 convention because of the the pickup element of it um, and I think if you asked Anthony himself he would admit it started off as a pickup convention um, and it's it's got a bit of a stigmata in, a, in some people with regards to that but to be honest that's bullshit really. Um, I, the first year I attended the convention um, and this year when I attended the convention um, I had been in a monogamous relationship for a number of years and I still found value in talks that I didn't expect to find value in, I, those uh, pickup artists who were talking. Um, they weren't just speaking on how to pick up chicks although that was an element of what they spoke about so they were also talking about how to build on that, how to develop relationships, talking about uh, interpersonal relationships and a lot of what they spoke about with regards to how to 
relate to women, um, I could take and apply into my own relationship with my girlfriend, but also see that those skills also apply to other interpersonal relationships as well. So for those people who are kind of sat there going, well, you know, I, I don't think I want to go, You've, you know, they're, they're, I'm not really interested in the pickup, I've got a wife or, you know, I've got a long-term girlfriend or, you know, I'm j just not interested in that there's still value to be had from those talks if you actually take the time to sit down with an active critical mind and listen to it and yeah there'll be stuff that doesn't necessarily apply to your situation but you can pick out if you're intelligent enough the things that will apply and you can find value in those different talks that you didn't expect to. It seems to be uh, ironic that the the biggest criticism or the most common criticism levied at the uh, 20 convention as a whole uh, is its consistency but that's misperceived as being a dogma by many critics. Um, consistently they have talkers on exercise who come from a high intensity training perspective, uh, talkers on nutrition from a paleolithic or an evolutionary perspective, uh, people who are talking on pickup on similar topics uh, and philosophically and politically um, from a, a rational perspective, from an objectivist style uh, perspective. Um, and it's interesting that the fact that this is consistent is levied as a criticism because knowing Anthony personally, he's a, a critical and active minded guy. Um, and when he finds something that he knows to be true based upon the evidence he's seen, he'll consistently uh, go with that idea and uh, apply it uh, congruently uh, throughout his life and therefore throughout the convention. Um, but in the same respect, I know from talking to him that he in the past has held completely counter ideas to this, completely contradictory ideas. Um, and when presented with uh, evidence that's undeniable that those ideas are false and that another set of ideas are true, he's changed his ideas and that's shone through in the way the 21 convention has been presented. At the moment, you know, Anthony is sure of the ideas he is presenting in the, uh, in the convention. He's confident of them and therefore they're consistent. I'm sure that if uh, evidence came to pass that some of the ideas weren't, you know, entirely true he would spin on a dime and change them because it's not the ideas that he's uh, being consistent with it's his uh, perspective on reality and his adherence to it and his pursuit of the truth that he's being consistent to resistance training to momentary muscular failure has a significant impact on all the components that constitute cardiovascular fitness. In layman's terms, what it allows is uh, the metabolic processes that constitute aerobic and cardiovascular fitness to be maximally stimulated and therefore adapt in the same way that the muscle would do if, uh, as a, uh, a plastic tissue if it was maximally stimulated. The same thing happens to the vasculature, the capillaries that supply that muscle as well. Um, so in layman's ter terms, resistance training to momentary muscular failure stimulates maximally the muscles that are involved in uh, the movements being performed and therefore increases their ability to uh, perform aerobically and, and cardiovascular, uh, cardiovascularly. In the academic world, um, certainly from my perspective, from what I've read, um, from other academics I've spoke to and heard talk, there is this distinct dichotomy uh, presented between uh, resistance training and typical cardio or endurance training um, and strength adaptations or anaerobic adaptations and aerobic or cardiovascular adaptations. Uh, terms are used interchangeably which just confuses the matter further. There are a, uh, a number of things that kind of prop up this dichotomy which uh, to me appears to be false when the evidence is appropriately examined. Uh, one of them being the, uh, or, or the person who started to introduce that dichotomy was Ken Cooper, Kenneth Cooper in the 70s with his aerobics concept, trying to split up the anaerobic and aerobic uh, metabolic pathways. The anaerobic pathways performing uh, work and creating energy in the absence of oxygen and the aerobic pathways creating energy in the presence of ox oxygen. 
Kenneth Cooper tried to create a, a form of exercise or mode of exercise that he thought would just work the aerobic uh, pathway. But the fact of the matter is that, that that's not true. The anaerobic pathway feeds into the aerobic pathways. It feeds in the substrate that the mitochondria actually uses uh, to produce energy in the uh, presence of oxygen. Um, so that was one of the first things that started to create this kind of false dichotomy. And since then, um, training programs have been uh, designed based upon this anaerobic aerobic dichotomy which has further strengthened the idea that because strength training was high intensity and uh, of a short duration it only worked the anaerobic pathways and because endurance training or aerobic training or cardio training however it was being labeled at the time uh, because it was longer and, and of a lower intensity was working the aerobic pathways it just reinforced this dichotomy uh, more recently we've studied into the metabolic pathway uh, sorry molecular pathways that actually create those adaptations um, there are two opposing pathways, one that stimulates these muscular adaptations in terms of improvements in strength and uh, power, and another that in uh, induces these adaptations which contribute to endurance and cardiovascular uh, fitness. Now, on the acute level, these two pathways appeared to be opposing each other, and while one was elevated, the other one would be depressed and vice versa. Um, but the problem was these, these studies didn't really kind of control their variables such as intensity appropriately. Um, they were performed in uh, rat subjects, the, the first ones were, and these results were just taken uh, and just slapped on and applied to humans. Uh, interestingly, uh, less than a year later, another study was published that disproved this and showed that Intense resistance training, i.e. to momentary muscular failure, actually stimulated the uh, molecular pathways that improved cardiovascular fitness and the ones that improved uh, strength adaptations as well. Just the time scale of these different things uh, differed. Immediately after exercise, the cardiovascular adaptation pathway was in, uh, upregulated. After a while, that started to come down and the molecular pathway that induced strength adaptation started to come up. So both pathways were active. It was just the timing at which you looked at them and also the intensity of the exercise that dictated whether or not one was activated or the other. Recently in trying to get uh, the paper published that discussed these aspects of resistance training and their effects on cardiovascular fitness, uh, published was was very difficult because of the um, the false notions held in academia these kind of dogmas that have not been challenged uh, up to this date in the in the way we presented them uh, we found a lot of difficulty in dealing with reviewers uh, who either didn't appear to understand the concepts or editors who were flat out resistant to publishing the paper a lot of the comments we got back while at the same time helping improve the quality of the paper in terms of its presentation um, didn't really add a lot in terms of uh, critiquing the paper or adding to its ideas and it wasn't until we approached the journal that is published in now, Journal of Exercise Physiology, that we felt we uh, had found a, an open and active minded critical uh, editor and a set of reviewers who treated the paper uh, without any uh, obvious preconceived biases. Um, we've published, myself and James Fisher have published another paper discussing the peer review process and some of the uh, barriers that we feel that we've, uh, certainly we faced and that other young scientists with controversial new ideas that go against uh, years and years of accepted wisdom and, and frankly dogma uh, in certain disciplines the problems that they tend to face when trying to present their new ideas. Um, so we've discussed that previously in another paper as well. Uh, and, and that's from our experiences and the experiences of others. In the paper that we uh, published, we discussed a lot of areas where there's research lacking. Uh, and I also highlighted areas that I think research needs to be more fine-tuned and more defined, certainly in the way it controls the variables that it's looking at. Many of the studies haven't appropriately controlled for intensity, which is the main thing that we highlight in the paper. They've misconstrued load in resistance training as being synonymous with intensity, when that's just uh, not true. Intensity is uh, 
indicative of effort involved in the exercise. So for example, uh, studies that have looked at oxygen cost, VO2, uh, during resistance training um, have often not had their participants trained to failure. Uh, they've often uh, included rest periods as well and they've also tried to compare those oxygen costs relative to oxygen uh, cost VO2 measured during a whole body exercise, i.e. on a treadmill or a bike uh, or on an uh, elliptical or um, trainer. And the problem is, uh, because of false notions regarding the relative amount of oxygen cost uh, during exercise that's required to produce cardiovascular adaptations, um, these resistance training studies give the impression that it doesn't give a sufficient stimulus. Now the training studies show a different story. It does improve uh, VO2 max in uh, both untrained uh, individuals, uh, young and old. Um, but what I'd like to see is studies that more accurately look at what the working muscles are actually doing in terms of their oxygen cost, because that's where the adaptations seem to occur. And comparing them to VO2 max measured during a maximal treadmill uh, test uh, is just comparing apples and oranges in my, uh, in my understanding of it. So it, that's where I want to see uh, research in that area going. And uh, in the paper I highlight you know, other areas where there are mechanisms that may be involved in stimulating adaptation. So at the periphery in the vasculature where we get this capillarization, this increase in the amount of uh, the number of capillaries fueling, uh, sending um, uh, blood to the muscles and taking away waste products. Um, there may be, there are some mechanisms that were discussed in the paper, i.e. increase in uh, nitric oxide production and uh, shear stress on the vasculature uh, that may be involved, but there needs to be more research done in that area, so I'd like to see that done. Um, an additional uh, thing that needs to be looked at is uh, lactate threshold, which is another typical measurement of cardiovascular fitness. In addition, I'd like to see uh, more research done on, for example, measurements like lactate threshold, looking at uh, how they improve in response to resistance training, because at the moment there's a lack of studies looking at that, and uh, it's generally conceived to be a, an important measurement of cardiovascular fitness or endurance performance, certainly at, at uh, below maximal uh, workloads. So that's another area I'd like to see research being done and how I'd like to see it move forward. At the same time, all of this research needs to more appropriately define its variables and control those variables instead of changing a host of different things uh, and then trying to draw some conclusion from it when it's nearly impossible to do so. In terms of frequency uh, of high intensity resistance training, resistance training to momentary muscular failure, uh, with regards to its adaptations on cardiovascular fitness, at the moment it's unclear as to whether there's an optimal frequency. Uh, with regards to strength adaptations, um, it seems to be that once, twice a week is optimal for the majority of the population in terms of producing the optimal adaptations. These studies just haven't been done though, just looking at changes in frequency while holding all other variables constant and um, to see what effect that might have on cardiovascular fitness. At the same time, uh, differences in load and repetition duration haven't been looked at with regards to those uh, adaptations, nor have set number. Uh, what we found was consistently though, different studies have used different load schemes, repetition duration schemes, frequencies, uh, set volumes, uh, but the one thing that those studies that showed improvements had as consistent was the intensity. So some studies have shown that once a week training, uh, single set to momentary muscular failure is sufficient to produce adaptations. Whether or not those cardiovascular adaptations are comparable to other frequencies uh, is not truly known yet. There needs to be studies done to compare that. Um, but certainly it does seem that low frequency, low volume, but high intensity training can produce those adaptations. Where do I see the 21 convention going in five years time? Well, at the rate it's expanded from uh, its inception uh, back in 2007, if it continues at that rate, um, it's going to be far bigger than it is now. It's growing exponentially in terms of the uh, attendees it's attracting, and that's a direct consequence of the exceptional speakers, uh, not to sound too big-headed, that Anthony is uh, attracting to the convention. Uh, these are great speakers on a wide variety of topics, all 
presenting fundamentally the same principles uh, but applied to different areas. Uh, and I think it's going to really start to take off, you know, shoot real high. It's going to become a, a, a world acknowledged uh, convention, not only in terms of the, you know, the d direct attendees and people who follow the website and the videos online, but I think it's going to be start to become more of a, a talking point in terms of the popular media. It's going to become well known. It's going to put its place on the map, I think, uh, because of its consistency and because of its integrity and just because of the you know sheer awesomeness of the content people who have influenced my personal growth um I could list a number of them I could list loads of them um, but I'll pick out a few that really stand out to me um to begin with, I started off getting into high intensity training through Mike Mentzer, the uh, bodybuilder's writings. Um, through that, I was also introduced to a philosophy and more as a, uh, an area of study. I'd always been interested in it, but it wasn't until I started reading Mike's works and the way it was presented in a logical, rational uh, and philosophical manner that I started to take an interest in studying philosophy. Um, I was introduced to Rand's works, Ayn Rand's uh, works through that and uh, found her to be an increasingly influential uh, person in my life in terms of what her ideas were. Um, in terms of friends, uh, I, I, my friend Sean Toomer, who attended a few years back uh, last year with me, he's been a very influential uh, person in my life in terms of the way he's conducted his life in a similar way to mine. Uh, as an individual, as a rational individual, striving for the best in his life. Uh, and, and I see that in Anthony as well. And, I, and I'm happy to say that Anthony's been quite an influential uh, figure in my li life as well. Uh, same sort of age, um, same sort of ideals. Uh, and it's no coincidence that when I became introduced to him uh, through his blog online, that um, we seem to be very similar individuals. And, and it's like I say, it's no coincidence. It just seemed to me to be uh, the natural state of two rational individuals coming to similar conclusions about the topics that they've looked at. I'm coming to the end of uh, my PhD, uh, the research I'm specifically doing at the moment, and I have a number of other directions I want to take with the research I'm doing right now, the uh, research I've proposed that needs to be done with regards to uh, resistance training and cardiovascular fitness, and other areas as well where I've read things that I don't necessarily agree with or I think uh, that have found holes in the current area of uh, evidence and felt that they needed to be plugged, I found those questions that need to be answered. Uh, Job-wise, I don't know where that's going to take me, but I see myself in five years' time somewhere that enables me to uh, perform research and answer those questions, uh, and then take those answers uh, and present them to other people as well. Uh, because not only do I selfishly do it because I you know, find the answers interesting uh, and important in my life, but I take a lot of selfish uh, interest out of presenting those ideas to other people and take a lot of value myself from allowing people to understand those ideas.